because I spotlight myself, uh, only my face will appear on uh, any uh, recording that we post online. I also want to let people know on YouTube, I did post the Israeli soldiers talk and uh, you can go and watch that. Uh, very nice. Um, of course, I didn't record the question and answer where there were a lot of more interesting stuff, but that is why uh, it always pays to come in person if you can make it. Um, but nevertheless, it's worth worth well worth your half an hour to watch uh, his talk. Um, today, we're going to finish chapter 17, hopefully. And chapter 17 um, sums up, or I should say finishes off a section of the Tanya. And that is the first uh, uh, Tanya section in telling you how to live your life. Meaning like this, the beginning of Tanya, the first 12 chapters are setting the stage. They're telling you your makeup, what you're made out of, what's good, what's bad. You have to have definitions, right? You can't have conversations without definitions. So you know, the first 12 chapters are more giving definitions, okay? Uh, then once we get in mid chapter 12, we kind of transfer to now that we have these definitions, how do I live my life? What do I do? And chapter 12 through 17 really uh, tell us that there's a certain way of serving God, which is predicated on the idea that the mind rules over the heart. And as we've discussed in the last bunch of weeks, and I'll summarize at the end as well today, but as we discussed last bunch of weeks, mind ruling over the heart means for most of us, not that our mind can control our feelings, but if our mind and our heart are at odds, uh, our mind should always win. In other words, we should always be able to at least do the correct actions. Now, of course, uh, we can also use our mind to create certain feelings that we want to create, but there's never a promise. But at the very least, we can use our mind to control our actions. And that is really the general thesis of, of chapter 12 through 17. Um, chapter 18 is going to go on a different thesis, another way, you know, if that's not working for you or a quicker way, not the long, you know, but Regardless, this is one way of, of, of taking the information that we've learned in Natanya as serving God, the mind ruling over the heart. Um, we, we had a lot of interesting discussions last bunch of weeks. It's definitely worth uh, looking those all up because they're all within this same theory and thesis of mind ruling over the heart. And uh, we will summarize what we studied, but uh, there are a lot of very interesting uh, concepts that come out of it. However, there is one problem with the mind rules over the heart theory. And I think we've touched upon it in previous classes, but here the Alter Rebbe will discuss it uh, straight up. And that is that uh, all of this only works if your mind rules over your heart. Uh, the problem is that um, there are some people who their minds do not anymore have the power to rule over their hearts. So we know of in medical and clinical terms, there might be people who have severe addiction, where we may consider them to not be able to make the right decision, even though their mind knows the correct idea. We also have uh, a concept called people who are obsessive, right? OCD of certain things. Sometimes people have obsessions. And again, we may in medical clinical terms may consider those people not be able to have their mind control their heart. But we have to remember the Alta Rebbe is a book, uh, not of medical science. It's a book of... Um, spiritual science, so to speak. Um, he gives the spiritual issues and the spiritual remedies. So my take on Atanya is if someone has uh, addiction, although Jewish teachings can help you, uh, generally uh, you probably need to get to a, a clinician or something like that. Uh, I know there's a rabbi called Rabbi Shea Stahl wrote a book about the 12 steps in Judaism. Uh, I haven't finished reading it. I have it in my house, but I haven't finished reading it. But um, it's... Um, you know, obviously there, there's a lot of crossover, but a book like the Tanya is not going to discuss addiction straight out because if you have an addiction, that's something to go to a therapist, so to speak, possibly. Again, the rabbis can help. Um, same thing if someone suffers obsession, um, someone has obsessive issues. Uh, Judaism is not, or I shouldn't say Judaism is not, the Tanya is not discussing, um, you know, so to speak, medical issues. It's going to discuss spiritual maladies. But we can take out from what it discusses in the spiritual malady that um, that can give us some inkling into the physical maladies, as I'm calling them. Not really physical because they're mental, but I'll call them physical. So the Tanya is going to give us over here one scenario where spiritually, um, even if, even though naturally, as the Alter Rebbe said earlier, naturally your mind should rule over your heart. 
there are going to be uh, cases where uh, you're going to lose that natural power. And the case that he gives is someone who is wicked. Why? Um, well, generally, the power of the mind over the heart, as we've discussed earlier, a lot of it has to do as well with our godly soul. However, when someone sins multiple times, they start to lose connection with their godly soul. And once they lose connection with their godly soul, um, obviously their godly soul is still there, but it creates a situation in which their mind will have much more trouble ruling over the heart. And that is why, as we're going to discuss, our sages tell us that wicked people, Rishayim, wicked people, they are not, their mind is not in control of their heart. Just the opposite, their heart is in control of their mind. And there's actually a very fascinating um, uh, uh, diuk. There's a fascinating, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my, 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 my language today. Uh, <laughs> I got the Hebrew, but uh, there's a fascinating, um, let's, let's, look up, let's look up translation, you know, thank God for translation. Uh, let's see, translation, uh, there's a accuracy notes. Okay, it's not the right word. Okay, there's a fascinating, um, if you're a linguist, uh, the, the sages point out that in the verses, the way the verses talk about righteous people and wicked people, how they talk to their hearts is very different. It says when righteous people are talking to their heart, it says, Vayomer elibo, they told to their heart. Okay, there's many places where the scripture talks about he told to his heart. You also have it says God also, and God told to his heart. It says that in 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 uh, in uh, Noah. But anyways, but when wicked people, it says they talk in their heart. For example, it says and Haman said in his heart that probably the king wants to honor me. So what's the difference between talking to your heart and saying in your heart? There's a very big difference. If you're talking to your heart, that means your mind is in control, and it's telling your heart what you feel. Uh, but when you're talking in your heart, that means it's your heart that is really in control and your mind has to follow your heart. So the example is, for example, Haman. Okay, Haman is the great example. Um, Haman was um, really a stupid in many ways. Okay, He was wicked, he was wise, but he also did some really stupid things. Um, for example, uh, he knew that Mordechai saved the king's life. So why did he even show up to the king to ask the king to hang Mordechai before he hung all other Jews? Remember, Haman already passed the decree to hang all the Jews. Then he wanted to hang Mordechai separately, you know, uh, uh, you know, a half a year before all the rest of the Jews would kill. Like, I would tell Haman, have patience. Like, you know Mordechai killed the king. You know, if you're killing Mordechai amongst all the other Jews, the king is probably not going to say anything. But why would you come to ask the king specifically to kill the guy that saved his life? But again, he wasn't thinking rationally. And then when the king asks him, what should they do to someone that they need to honor? Why did Haman assume it's him? But again, his ego, his heart was in control of his mind. He didn't think rationally many times. And uh, we unfortunately embody the Haman sometimes in ourselves. That, um, you know, it says in Perky, about the ethics of our fathers, it says, that desire removes a person from the earth. Uh, desire uh, really um, removes people from this earth. What does that mean? It doesn't mean literally they die, but it says when, when your desires, when you let your desires lead, you can, you can end up doing silly, stupid, irrational things. And uh, that's the way many of us are. I also want to say one more thing. Now, obviously, there are some people that um, theologically um, don't believe in God. But for many of people, um, the theology is born out of their heart. I can tell you, I went to, uh, you know, religious school, yeshiva. And um, I have, you know, classmates who became not religious, you know. And uh, the vast majority of them... Sorry, I would say all of them. None of them really wasn't really not theological. You know, was, you know, they were young. They wanted to have more fun in life. Okay. And, uh, um, or there, I have other classmates suffered tragedy in their life. Um, I'm not saying it never comes out, you know, but typically, you know, um, things start in the heart. 
for many of us. For many of us, our life decisions start in our hearts. For Jews, maybe it starts in the stomach. You know, there's different ways of doing it. But, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of stuff starting in our heart. I mean, even everybody knows. Um, if you go to a wonderful soul, but you don't have a great connection with the uh, rabbi or the spiritual leader, you know, that's what you're not going to necessarily want to continue going. It's, there's got to be that heart part of it there. Um, very few of us are like the ultimate that the Tanya talks about of the people who are truly 100% ruled by their mind. So what I'm trying to say is that here in this section of Tanya, although it's going to discuss a wicked person that completely has zero control over their heart, um, we all should recognize and know that uh, we, we might have that in certain areas of our life. Even though we are not completely wicked, uh, there may be parts of our life where we are making um irrational decisions because uh we've allowed too much control of our heart in uh, that part of our life but all that being said the natural state of a person of a human being is that the mind should rule over the heart and uh, if you recognize that your issue is that you've come to a place where uh your mind cannot control your heart um, that alone will help you figure out what you need to do next. As I mentioned in previous classes, a lot of times it's not actually a, an issue of the mind ruling over the heart. It's a matter of desire. We don't really desire it. So we say we want it, but we don't really want it. And you have to recognize and be truthful with that as well. So I think I confused everybody in the last few minutes. I'm sorry. Um, to summarize what I'm trying to say is that naturally the mind should rule over the heart. Naturally, uh, uh, a, 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 and righteous people have this 100%. Their mind can rule over the heart to the point where they can even dictate their feelings. But most regular people, their minds should be able to decide what to do despite what their heart wants. Wicked people are completely, when I say wicked, I mean 100% wicked people. Wicked people are 100% in the power of their heart. And then I think there are those of us who are in between those two stages. In other words, I'd say very few of us can con completely control our emotions, you know, turn on love and turn on fear, turn on awe at a dime. No, most of us don't have that. But we're stuck between these two, between people who can control their actions based on their mind and people who can't, who their hearts control the way they live their life. I think most of us are somewhere in between that because most of us are not the completely wicked person that Atanya discusses. Most of us are what Atanya calls elsewhere, the wicked person who has good. So uh, we should recognize the different areas of our life. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for letting me know it made sense. Okay. So now that I've given you this um, heads up, um, let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at the uh, Tanya that actually tells us about these people that have lost self-control. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, if you want to know what do you do if you lose self-control in a certain area where your heart has uh, completely ruled, where your heart is, uh, you know, ruling your mind, uh, the Tanya discusses it later. And the answer is that you have to have a broken heart. As one of the great Hasidic masters says, there's nothing as whole as a broken heart. Fascinating line. Nothing as whole as a broken heart. Um, what that means is sometimes we become too uh, uh, physical. We become... You know, you know, you just allowed your heart too much control. You need to, so to speak, break your heart, become brokenhearted, as they call it. And that can sometimes open you up to a new lifestyle. But we're not up to there yet. But let's let's read the problem. Um, let's take a look here. Okay. So, so far we have discussed the tzaddik who has control of his heart and the vanity, an aspiring vanity whose brain rules over the heart, right? So again, the tzaddik controls his heart, meaning... His emotions are completely led by his mind like that. The Bainini, his brain rules over the heart, means his brain can rule over the heart like with an iron fist. The heart says this, the mind says that, the mind rules. The Tanya now turns to the third category, the absolute Russia who is totally ruled by his feelings. Generating enough love to observe the mitzvos is very much within reach for every person unless he is a real wicked person. A real wicked person is the complete Russia, the Russia who has it bad, in whom the evil in his animal soul is all that remains as having the influence within him. For the evil has so overwhelmed the good that it has caused the good to depart from inside him. Now, the Tanya, as we explained last time, what does it mean that the, the good departs him? It means it's very hard for him to get in touch. It's like the good is there, but it's, so to speak, above him. It's not in him. 
It's not physical. It's metaphysical, of course. The term real Rasha would perhaps also apply to incomplete Rasha who has enough good to contemplate repentance, but not enough to actually... Okay, I don't know what he's saying there. Okay, I'm going to skip that. the notes. Um, ah, okay, I see what he's saying. Someone who, who thinks about doing good but never actually does it. Okay, it's an interesting point. Okay, but then he continues. The main point is... There's someone who can lose his complete control by being completely wicked. As our sages of blessed memory taught, that Rishayim, wicked people, are controlled by their hearts. Genesis. And their hearts aren't in their control at all. Like an addict, the real Russia has relinquished self-control to the extent that he is now ruled by his passions. But if inherently and naturally the brain rules over the heart, as we've learned, how is it possible Um for the real Rishayim to lose self-control. So now we turn the page to uh, page 206. This loss of self-control is the penalty from heaven imposed due to the extent and magnitude of their sins. How can this be reconciled with our verse in Deuteronomy, which states that observing the mitzvahs is very much within our reach? Right? So when the Torah stated that observing the commandments was within everyone's ability, it is not referring to the real Rishayim, real wicked people are considered as dead people. As the Talmud teaches that Rishayim, wicked people are called dead in their lifetime. Since they have deadened themselves to good in their souls, the verse in Deuteronomy only addresses those who are alive. For real Rishayim who are dead, the verse does not apply. Okay, uh, a mouthful, but he says a very interesting thing. He says here that wicked people are called dead. Therefore, when the Torah says, it is close to everybody to do what they need to do. It's not referring to dead people. Of course, it's only talking to live people. And since the wicked people are called dead in, uh, Jew in Judaism, um, therefore, uh, the Torah is not talking about them. Now, uh, just to explain, what does it mean wicked people are called dead? Um, so there's a lot of ways to understand what the Talmud means, but the very simple understanding goes like this is that in Judaism, life is God. God is life because God is eternal. Everything else is not really alive. It, it's temporarily uh, temporarily enabled, but it's not really alive. Alive really means something that is always alive. For example, uh, we've spoken about this, right? If I, if I um, take this pen and I throw it up and it falls back down, it's not a flying pen. It's a pen that is flying, okay? Again, I throw it up. I couldn't call this a flying pen. It's a pen that's flying. It happens to be flying because I threw it up. But naturally, this pen is down here. Okay? The same thing. It says life that is not inherent life, okay, life that's not eternal, is what we call temporary life. It's not actually alive. It's being given life temporarily, but it's not really alive. So we call it, it's something that's living, but it's not alive. Something that's alive is something that lives forever. Something that not something else is making alive, but it is naturally alive. naturally alive. So when we do good deeds, there's a part of us that's connecting with God, and that part of us becomes eternal. And so we can call that alive. So the mitzvahs that you do are eternal. The good deeds that you do are called eternal. Um, however, um, when we uh, do things that are sins, that part of us is, so to speak, dead, because that's not eternal. And that's why completely wicked people who only do wicked things are considered dead because there's no part of them that's alive. There's nothing that lasts. There's nothing that's eternal. Think of uh, your loved ones that have passed away. Uh, there are things that they've done that are eternal. You know, they've passed on eternal life. And that's, uh, you know, and that's why we say when people pass away, you know, may, 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 they be, may they be bound in the bond of life. There's the real life. And there's the things that were part of the life that uh, was a temporarily of importance. It's not of importance today. It's not a, a long-term importance to them, you know, the clothing that they wore, right? When we, we get buried, that's why we all get buried in burial shrouds. It's a message that the clothing that we wear is really just a temp temporary importance. Um, it's not really alive. You know, what's really alive are things that connect us with God. So that's just a simple uh, explanation to why wicked people are called dead, because there's nothing of their life that is eternal, and therefore, even while they're alive, we say they're living, but they're not alive. There's no part of them that's alive. But uh, us, uh, who are not completely wicked, have elements of us that are alive and will uh, live on forever. Um, so with that being said, um, I want to tell a story. Um, and then we'll go on to 
uh, the next part about how the wicked people can heal themselves. And that is like this. Um, the story goes like this. Reb Mendel of Vitebsk and Reb Levi Yitzchak of Barditchev, two great Hasidic Rebbes, two great Hasidic masters, they wore... Um, uh, uh, they one time had to go fundraising as Jews had to do in that time uh, for uh, a wedding. You know, back in the day, people were very poor and they had, some people had literally no money. And, and so to get married was less expensive than it is today, but it was still expensive. And so there were this, this young uh, couple of orphans who had no money. And so these two Rebbes wanted to go fundraising for them. So uh, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak said, told the other Rebbe, he says, I'll go fundraising with you, but only if I decide where we're going to fundraise. So he said, okay. So the first stop he brings him to is the town miser. Now, the town miser was known that he wouldn't give anybody any money. He was just a, uh, 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 what we call a cheapskate. You know, he, he just couldn't uh, get past the idea of giving someone else his hard-earned money. So, um, but nevertheless, anybody that ever came to him for money, he would first talk to them and talk to them and talk to them, but then pretty much leave them with nothing and they'd all get very angry. So uh, Reb Levi Yitzhak and uh, Reb Mendel, they go into this, they knock on a store, the rich man invites him in, oh, welcome, dear honored guests and Rebbes. And they start telling him the story and the rich man, the miser is listening intently and hearing the story and listening to the poor plight of this family. He says, wow, that sounds terrible. I really want to help out. And finally, they finish the conversation after a nice long conversation. And the rich man goes to his, uh, you know, big uh, china cabinet and opens up the jar and pulls out a rusty penny. Obviously, it wasn't a penny because it was in Russia, whatever they have there, Russian, a rusty penny. And he says, here, take this penny. Now, this this is the same penny the rich man's been using for the last, uh, you know, 2,000 poor people that came to him. This is basically what he did. Every poor person that would come to him, he talks to them and give them a penny. And of course, you can imagine after talking to a wealthy man for that long, they'd all take that penny and throw it back in his face. They'd say, I don't need you. I don't need your penny. I don't need your rusty penny. But Rebbe Levi Yitzchak said, Thank you so much. So much appreciated. Every penny counts. You're really going to change the lives of, the, of this couple. And uh, I can't thank you enough. And they walk out of the house and they start walking down the road. And as they're walking, the rich man says, come back, come back to my house, come back to my house. And they come back to his house. And then he gives them a couple more pennies. And once again, Rebbe Levius like, says, thank you so much. That was so kind of you. And he goes on and thanks and thanks and thanks him. I'm sorry, I came out of focus here. Okay. And, um, and, and this repeats itself time after time until ultimately the rich man gave them the full amount that they had requested. Okay. Um, so they finished the story and um, the, the, uh, uh, Relavius like explained the story and he said like this, he said that the rich man was literally incapable of giving charity. And uh, there was, and since nobody ever took the charity from him, there was nothing that was ever able to break through his heart. He was literally what we're talking about here. His heart was, was in control. And his heart was, was like an iron heart. It was closed up. There was no place to allow goodness. It's like we said a moment ago. The good is like outside of his body, so to speak. But he said, when you took the coin and you made him feel good, it, so to speak, penetrated his heart a little bit. And then slowly, as he gave more and more charity, it penetrated his heart more and more and more until he was able to give properly and from that point on the rich the miser became a, a, a big person who gave charity and that's what uh teshuva is about teshuva is breaking this so to speak iron wall it says in our sages say when we do a sin we so to speak create an iron barrier that separates between us and god and um therefore we need to do things to be able to break that barrier uh how many times have have uh, has it been seen people who uh they you know who say no 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 and then they do something once and then they break up volunteers and uh, they totally, you know, open up the floodgates open, so to speak. Um, it's a powerful, powerful thing. You know, we, we shouldn't give up on people. There's usually what it is, is, is they've created this wall, right? We know our, all ourselves as well, right? Uh, let's say we're in a fight with someone or there's an action we don't want to do, or there's, a, you know, there's, there's something in our lives that, that, um, that bothers us. And, um, uh, we, 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 we over time we build this giant wall in our minds and probably our hearts as well and then eventually uh one day a little crack comes into it and then that crack widens and widens and suddenly the whole facade that we built crumbles but you need to make that first crack 
Uh, so we got uh, two nice comments here. Um, okay, all right, and also, yeah, 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 the wall is being penetrated, yep. Yeah, we gotta penetrate the wall. Okay. Um, okay, I'm not sure what that one is, but I'll have to find out. Okay, um, yes, we gotta, we gotta penetrate the wall and we all have it in our own lives as well. Um, that wall that we build in our minds and our hearts and we need to penetrate it. So let's read over here to Tanya as it reads uh, the antidote for the wicked person. Again, talks about Teshuvah literally because he, he has spiritual sins. He, he says like this. Um, so he says like this. This does not mean to say, however, real Rishayim, real wicked people are irredeemable. In their present state, they may have buried the spark of good within them, but there's always the possibility of transformation through repentance. It says like this. Because in truth, Real Rishayim, real, real wicked people can't begin to worship God on a regular basis without first repenting for the past. In order to shatter the klipos, which have formed a permanent curtain of separation and an iron wall which interposes between them and their father in heaven. Right? So that's why I said a sin creates this curtain of separation. You got to penetrate it. These wicked people are held hostage, so to speak, by the negative energy they have brought upon themselves through their repeated self-actions, in order to san sanitize themselves to their soul again, they first need to overcome the blockage through a profound shiva. By the way, an example of this is Pharaoh. It says that, uh, it, it says by the first five plagues, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Then it says by the last five plagues, God hardened his heart for him. Why? That's what happened. You sin enough times, then you block, and then you're no longer in control of yourself. It says the same thing as Pharaoh. If you look at the verses, uh, Pharaoh originally had more control. He hardened his heart himself. But eventually, he, he lost control. And uh, what would he have had to do? He would have had to break his heart. This is done through feeling heartbroken and embittered in their souls over their sins. By the way, there's a, there's a, I think it's a medrash that says that Pharaoh survived the, 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 the splitting of the sea. Right? He survived that. And he then became the king of Ninveh, where Jonah came to. Right? Jonah, the prophet. And uh, then the whole town did the shuvah and broke their hearts. Just an interesting thing. Anyways. Teshuvah includes a variety of different elements, verbal confession, resolve not to sin again, but spiritually speaking, it is the deep feeling of remorse that breaks through the blockage of negative energy which has ensnared the person. And we say remorse um, because remorse is what's going to change it. Um, let's go here. Okay, 207. As the Zohar states on the verse... Uh, a broken spirit is a sacrifice for God. Uh, a heart that is broken and contrite, you do not reject, O God, that the impure spirit of the Sitrach was shattered by a broken heart. See the Zohar, Parshas Pinchas. Oh, I like that name. Uh, page 240, and Parshas Vayikra, page 8, uh, page eight and page 5. And, uh, okay, the, let's just read what the Zohar says. The Zohar states, when a man contaminates himself with the sins, he draws upon himself the impure spirit which imposes itself upon him, ruling over his desires. At the time when the temple stood, a man would offer his sacrifice, and a man means also a woman as well, would offer a sacrifice. Um and um and feel remorse, thereby breaking down that impure spirit. But if that impure spirit is not broken, then a sacrifice is worth nothing and is given to the dogs. Wow. And that is why scripture says that the proper sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. For that impure spirit has to be broken so that it will not be in control. Um, so imagine that. The Zohar tells us, even it's not like it's an automatic human, right? People think, oh, God just wants to sacrifice. The sacrifice uh, did, there are different elements of the sacrifice, but a, a very simple, you know, but part of the sacrifice was to break your heart. First of all, at a very simple level, bringing a sacrifice to God cost you money. So that alone, uh, you know, should make you think. Second of all, it says, as you watch what happens to the animal, you're supposed to think that what's happening to the animal should have happened to you. Um, again, uh, we have trouble understanding sacrifices today, but I'm just giving you some of the general ideas. Um, but the point is that nobody should ever think it's just like, oh, God just wants to sacrifice and that's it. As the Zohar says, if, uh, if you don't... Uh, if the impure spirit is not broken, the sacrifice isn't worth anything. So you got to have a broken heart. And therefore, that tells us today as well, when we don't bring physical sacrifices, we can have a broken heart. Okay. 
Uh, let's continue. This shattering of an impure spirit that restores a person's ability to control himself represents the level of lower teshuva. Um, the term teshuva, literally translated as repentance, is derived from the Hebrew term shav, means to return, right? Everybody heard the word teshuva? We translate it usually as repentance, but actually the Hebrew means tashuv, to return. Teshuva is the return or restoration of the soul to its prior healthy state. Right? So what we've discussed till now, now, from what we've discussed till now, we can understand what it means. Right? The natural state is the godly soul can shine. The godly soul can control the heart, can control the animal soul. When you sin, you get into an unhealthy state where the godly soul, so to speak, hidden and the heart and the animal soul rules. And when you do teshuva, a very basic level of return means a return of the natural order within yourself. So he says, broadly speaking, this can occur at two levels. Initially, there must be a return of the soul to its level prior to sin. This is referred to, a, to the Kabbalah as the lower teshuva. I might explain the higher teshuva in a moment, but let's continue. Oh, here it explains. So again, the lower teshuva literally is a balance within your body, the return of your soul to where it's meant to be. Subsequently, there can be a further return of the soul towards the level it enjoyed before it was born into body, when it was totally intimate with God. This is a return. Uh, this is a return. Uh, is that just a blurry picture that I took? Yeah, it looks like it. I might have to take another picture. Well, whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll get through it. I'll just read. Once you get to the main part, we have, uh, we have it anyway. So we're on page 208 if you have the book. Also a good reason to get a book. Anyways, it says referred to as the higher teshuva. These two levels are discussed at length in the third section of Tanya. In our case, the lower teshuva is sufficient to release the real rush of the wheel working person from the impure spirit which holds him back from exerting the necessary discipline for worship. So just to explain the higher level of teshuva means, again, if teshuva means return, so a lower level of teshuva means a return to the balance within your soul. A higher level of teshuva means to literally return your soul to where it was before your soul came into this body. Meaning, uh, before our souls came into this body, they were able to be more spiritual. The body creates certain shackles on the body. And so a higher level of teshuva really applies even when we didn't sin. That higher level of teshuva can apply even to someone who's been righteous their whole life. They can also do teshuva to return their soul to a higher, elevated place. That is why, by the way, the Talmud tells us, I think it's the Talmud, maybe the Zohar says, that Mashiach is going to make tzaddikim, righteous people, do teshuva. So the commentators want well, to know, what, what do righteous people need to do teshuva for? What are they repenting for? Based on our understanding now that teshuva just means a return, well, then even righteous people can do teshuva. They can return their soul to a higher level. But be that as it may, most of us are going to deal in our lives with a lower level of teshuva, literally returning the balance of power within your body to allow your godly soul to shine. And uh, now he gives the Kabbalistic idea of, of it to restore the letter He of the Tetragrammaton, spelled in the Hebrew Yud K Vav K. The Kabbalists taught that since it actually damaged the spiritual realms, a process symbolized by fragmentation of Tetragrammaton, Tetragrammaton is God's four letter name. When lower teshuva is performed, the lower, the final lower He of the Tetragrammaton is symbolically restored. Higher teshuva, on the other hand, is the effect of restoring the higher letter, letter He. Just to show you what I'm talking about, let's go to Tetragrammaton. I don't know. Spell it. Tetragrammaton. Uh, let's see if we can uh, pull it up on the screen. Okay, so here's God's name. Right? Uh, open an image, a new tab. All right, let's take a look. All right, so this is God's name. Everybody sees, uh, hopefully, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, you're seeing the right thing. Okay, so this is God's name. So God's name is a Yud, then a He, then after that comes above, then a He. So the commentaries point out that there's, or I should say the Kabbalists point out, we're not going to get deep in it, but there's two letters of hey. And so the lower level of teshuva means the lower hey, so to speak, fell off the cliff. And you got to bring it back, connect it to the vav. And the higher level of teshuva is where the higher hey returns to the yud. If you don't know what that is, that's fine. I think the Tanya discusses it in the second section of more at length. But uh, I just wanted to show you so you know generally what it's talking about. We're not going into that. Kabbalistic idea today. But you get the general idea. Kabbalistic teshuva is returning. Everything that we do mirrors a spiritual reality. So when our soul sins, when, when we sin and our soul falls off the cliff, so to speak, uh, that affects the letter He of God's name. Okay. 
So I'll leave it at that. Um, but let's continue. Uh, so he says like this. Lower Teshuvah has the power to elevate the final lower letter, letter hay from its fall into the shallow forces of Klippa and fall brought about by sin. So we can pull the hay, also our soul, out of the Klippot. The final hay is fragmented and dislocated from God's name. The negative forces of the universe become parasites for its free energy. The excruciating emotions of the Teshuvah are necessary to extricate the hay from its enmeshment and the shallow forces and restore it back to the tetragrammaton. And now he's going to say something interesting. Uh, this is a um, powerful meditation that it talks about uh, later in the Tanya. Uh, a, a good, um, shall I say, impetus not to sin. A good um, uh, motivation not to sin. And that is that when we sin, we have to realize that we are not only affecting ourselves, but we are affecting God, so to speak. Uh, if you look in the commentaries... Sorry, if you look in the Talmud and, and other uh, uh, books of our sages, um, it's very clear that it says when the Jews went into exile, it says that God himself also went into exile. Right? In other words, it's not that God is saying, I'm staying here and I'm sending you to exile. It says, Shechina Iman, God's divine presence, went into exile as well. Um, in fact, it says that there were 10 exiles of the divine presence. It says there were 10 stages that the divine presence kept moving out of the temple until it totally went into exile. Um, so, but that means also that's on a, that's on a, uh, macro level on a micro level. When we sin, we are also taking God's divine presence and, uh, putting it into exile. How so we just mentioned a moment ago, uh, how, you know, we can pull God's letter. Hey, into the unclean forces, but at a very simple level, our soul is godly. Our godly soul is godly. When we sin, and we create that barrier. We slowly drag our godly soul into places where it doesn't want to be. We drag our godly soul into the powers of the unclean forces. And it's, so to speak, stuck there until we can redeem it. And um, it's very painful for the godly soul, which the godly soul is a piece of God. In fact, the Tanya, later on, I believe, uh, I don't know what section, gives a vivid description of it. And it says... Imagine when you sin as if you're taking the head of the king and putting the head of the king in the toilet. The head of the king meaning you're taking the king, you're taking his head, and you're stuffing his head in the toilet. He says that's what we do when we allow our soul, our godly soul, to be enmeshed within the klipot, within the unclean forces. It's like literally taking the king and putting his head in a bowl of feces. It's a vivid description, but that's uh, literally what he's saying happens. Um you know, it's an interesting story as well, just to, just to bring it home. Um, you know, the uh, there was uh, Rabbi Posner, Rabbi Zalman I. Posner. He was a Chabad emissary from the previous Rebbe, sixth Chabad Rebbe in the 40s, to Nashville, I believe it was Nashville, Tennessee. I think it was Nashville. Uh, anyways, after the previous Rebbe passed away in 1950, he contemplated, you know, his, his Rebbe had passed away, and he was thinking of... Uh, you know, going to college. Now, you may know that college is an interesting place. I think we can see today that college is a very interesting place with lots of beliefs that are being taught on many colleges that may lead to interesting protests. But for years, uh, colleges had, forget about the political, uh, you know, things they may teach there, but for years, colleges had a very, very anti-religious um, sentiment. And I'm not just... Uh, you know, speak, and this was proven because many, many religious Jews who went to college uh, lost their faith. When again, really, a, a place of higher education should not be imposing any ideas; it should be giving objective, uh, you know, ideas and let people choose. And and but you know, the professors snuck in their beliefs and in, you know into a lot of their teachings. And uh, many, many religious Jews uh, struggled in college to maintain their uh, religiosity. That that created later on religious colleges, you know, Yeshiva University or Torah College or whatnot. Today, there are many religious colleges. But anyways, so uh, Rabbi Posner wanted to go to a college. He said, I'll go to college for a couple of years. He said, I'll take a break from the rabbinate. And then I'll come back and go back to the rabbinate and all my PhD and everything. And uh, it's not that the Rebbe never told anybody to go to college, but it depended on the case. Anyways, in this case, the Rebbe told him, who had then taken over, says, if you go to college, you have to realize that you are an emissary of the previous Rebbe. And in Jewish law, when you're someone's emissary, 
you are an extension of them. And so if you go to college, you are bringing the Lubavitch Rebbe to college with you. You are bringing him there with you. And, uh, you know, why would you want to do that to him? And uh, so that sentiment is the same sentiment that we're taking here now. The idea that we can't think we take individual actions. It's just my individual action. You know, let me just disconnect from God for a few moments. Let me do my, have my fun and then I'll come back to it. You can never disconnect from God. And therefore, if you do actions that are, so to speak, disconnecting from God, what you're really doing is taking your piece of God that's within you and you're forcing it into places where it doesn't want to go. And uh, so you can't disassociate yourself from your godly soul. All you can do is torture it. That's what we're going to read here. That's the idea that he's going to present here. He's going to present it on the macro level and it applies it on the micro level as well. So he says like this. This is the secret of the Shekhinah's exile. As in the saying of our rabbis of blessed memory, when the Jewish people were exiled to Edom, that is the Roman exile, the Shekhinah was with them. Oh, there the Talmud. That's what I was referring to. The Shekhinah was exiled with them. The Shekhinah, God's presence on earth, is principally linked with the land of Israel and the site of the temple in Jerusalem. But the Talmud teaches that when the Jewish people were banished from their land, the Shekhinah joined them in exile. Normally, this is understood to mean that God continues to be present with the Jewish people wherever they are found, but the Kabbalists emphasized that a different angle. The secret of the Shekhinah is the exile. They stressed how this process was painful for the Shekhinah herself, so to speak. That she, the Shekhinah, would prefer to be in her land. And when forced to join the Jewish people in exile, she suffers the pain of banishment too. The reason why we're saying she is the word Shekhinah is feminine. Uh, people want to know is God masculine or feminine? And we had it in one of our daily courses where we said neither. However, um, God has both different energies. And that's why sometimes some of God's names, uh, you know, focus on the masculine, some on the feminine, uh, focusing on different energies. All right, but let's continue. But the Shafina is a feminine. The, to further explain the secret, the ta Tanya now offers commentary on the Talmud statement when they, were, when they were exiled to Edom. Literally, this is a geographical, uh, this is a geographical reference to the Roman exile, beginning approximately in 63 BCE and continuing to the present day. But the Tanya offers a mystical reading of the Talmud statement. So let's read how the Tanya reads it. I hope I'm not reading too fast, but I might be. Um, Namely, when a person sins, practicing the behavior of Adam. So again, it's giving a more mystical meaning of what it says. He draws down there into his impure act, that godly component and spark found within his soul, which endows the soul's powers of nefesh, ruach, and neshama with life. So in this reading, the exile of the Shekhinah occurs when the sinner himself, through his sinful acts, has caused the spark of God in his soul to become enmeshed in the negative forces of Klippa, this forced displacement to the impure realms is extremely painful to the Shina. So what he's saying here is that when it says, when they were exiled to Edom, it means when you exile into deeds, Edomite deeds, Roman deeds, selfish deeds, then you are placing the Shechina that's within you. So the, the Tanya is reading this in a micro level. Although it's speaking in the macro, it applies to the micro level as well. That you are now taking your godly soul, which is the Nefesh, Ruach, and the Shama. Those are the levels of your soul that are found within your body. There are high levels of your soul which are above your body, but those three levels of your soul that are in your, in your body, you're dragging them down. As he continues, where are you dragging them down? The powers of the divine soul dressed in him at that moment, sin become exile, trapped by the animal soul to creep in the heart's left chamber, which rules over him so long as he remains a Russia wicked person, controlling a small city's body, and his nefesh, ruach, and neshama are thereby held captive by it. To be a serial sinner is to effectively hold the divine soul's helpless captive inside his body and animal soul as the body descends negative forces. <clears throat> but when the person does teshuva, breaking his heart inside him, causing the impure spirit of the sitrach to be shattered, as we've learned from the Zohar, then all evildoers will be scattered. The negative forces in the Shekhinah, when in mesh, will crumble. Then when the divine spark in this individual is redeemed, she, the Shekhinah, rises upright from her fall and keep standing to, as explained elsewhere in the Shuvah, a, a beautiful you know, description of the beauty that happens when we complete it. So what did we take away from this? We took away from here, there's a possibility that if we sin too much, not only will we lose not only will we lose the control of our mind over our heart, but it's very painful for our godly soul as well. And the only way out of it is through a broken heart and through the contriteness and broken heart, uh, we will be able to redeem and elevate our soul and bring it back to the beauty 
of where it wants to go. And that's why, like I said, you, I've seen many stories, so many stories, right? If, uh, you know, we print in, in the show the, these illumination papers and every almost every week, there's a story of somebody who didn't want any connection with Judaism and then suddenly they did something and the first time they do an action, the first time they light Shabbat candles, they put on the film, they suddenly start crying. Why do they cry? Because their shell is broken. All right. Um, so with this, I want to end off today's class giving a summary of uh, the chapters 12 through 17 and uh, some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. We have, you know, six, six seven minutes and uh, we'll just go over the chapters <clears throat> of uh, this section of Tanya, which is the mind rules over the heart. So uh, we started off with chapter 12. And in chapter 12, we started off with this principle that the mind rules over the heart. And um, we learned, first of all, that the, that we don't have control over our impulse thoughts, but we can choose what thoughts to think about. Again, there are impulse thoughts that come to our mind. I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm this, I'm that. That's not what we're talking about, but you have control the next moment, okay? You have a, uh, 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 you have a, you have control over the uh, over the next moment. And um, we learned that with that, we have the ability to control over our anger our uh, and our other feelings. Again, there's a momentary anger that comes right away, but then we can choose to uh, diffuse that through our mind. Okay, so we can say I'm angry, but it's not right to be angry. Um, and we discussed that the mind should naturally always have that power and uh, that mind ruling over the heart should be used not only for our relationship with God, but also for our relationship with other people. We brought the example of Joseph, who was nice to his brothers, even though they were wicked to him. And that is an example of mind ruling over the heart. OK, so again, we gave the basic idea of mind rule over the heart. That brought us to chapter 13. Chapter 13 told us that although we said the mind rules over the heart, we should know where our weakness lies. And our weakness is um, that we have to know that most of us are not a tzaddik. Most of us are not righteous. And therefore, we will not have the ability to uh, completely rule over our heart like a tzaddik. In other words, we can't just you know turn on our feelings in a dime. But we can at least rule our actions. And so again, it's knowing our weaknesses. But nevertheless, chapter 13 also gave us something very beautiful. And it told us that, um, sorry, sorry, that's not that's not in that part. Um, we told ourselves that uh, in recognizing our weaknesses, we also have to remember that we should never trust ourselves because we know that we are not Sadiqim. Uh, we don't have full control over our bodies. We always need to have the mind ruling over the heart. We should never trust ourselves. In other words, it's a very important point. In other words, we always need to have the mind ruling over the heart so we can never let our guard down. And then we ended off saying that nevertheless, we should recognize that the way we serve God, even though it's not as great as it's sonic, it's called true. That was a discussion in chapter 13, but that even our divine service, our service of God can be called true because it's true at our level. Everybody has their own truth uh, in serving God. Then we discussed uh, chapter uh, 14, we discussed the idea that we were told we should try, strive to be a tzaddik. That means that we should, even though we know we'll never be a tzaddik, we should try and create within ourselves some great feelings. But nevertheless, uh, we should know that um, at the very least, we shouldn't be wicked. Okay, that was right. We said we we're promised we should try to be a tzaddik, but at the very least, don't be wicked. Okay. And we discussed there in chapter 14 how we all have different levels of our lives. I spoke about this, right? I said there are parts of our lives where we're like a tzaddik. We have certain things we, we have zero struggle, right? I, I, some of us, I could say, for example, um, don't have any uh, desire to murder, okay? Um, it's just not something we, we ever want to do, okay? It's not a struggle. Then there are areas of our lives where we struggle, but we always get it right, okay? Let's say, um, um, I don't know, there, there is our life where, where, where we have a, an internal struggle. We may want to do the wrong thing, but we'll never, uh, we'll never do it, right? Well, so maybe, let's say, for example, I... No, I don't have any struggle to eat pork. Okay, pork, it's not a struggle I have. Um, maybe for some people, though, it's a struggle. They've eaten it, but they know they're never going to eat it. And then there are areas of our lives where we're more like a wicked person, where we bounce back and forth. We sometimes do, we sometimes don't do it. Anyways, um, chapter 15, we discussed this idea that you might say, oh my gosh, my life is now difficult. You're telling me I'll never be able to get rid of my animal soul. It'll be a struggle my entire life. What's the point? Now we chapter 15, we said, but that's what serving God is about. 
If there's no struggle, there's no divine service of God, right? We discussed there's someone who served God and someone who is serving God. Therefore, even if you struggle your whole life, that means you're serving God every moment. That's, that's beautiful. That's a good thing. Then in chapter um, 16, we discussed that even though we've been discussing till now the importance of the mind ruling over the heart and the actions, we reiterate what we discussed in chapter 14, that number one, we should try and be like a tzaddik, that we should try to create through our mind feelings towards God. And we also added in that chapter that if you try to create feelings, even though you can't promise you'll make those feelings, but if you try to create those feelings, it'll be easier to do the right thing. Because if you feel it, you're more likely to do it. So again, even though naturally our minds can rule over our heart, but that's not the easy path. It's much easier if we can create the feelings. So we want to create the feelings. In addition to that, the struggle to create the feelings is serving God as well. Okay, then in chapter 17, which is this chapter, we discussed how uh, it is very much within our reach that you have the uh, mind rule over the heart, unless, of course, we're wicked. As we discussed, maybe we're not wicked in all areas, but in some areas of our life, we've lost control. And the way to get around uh, if we've lost the mind ruling over the heart is to have a broken heart. Um, in the next section, chapter 18, we're going to discuss a totally different paradigm of uh, taking the knowledge that we've had about ourselves and how to serve God. So not a mind rule over the heart, uh, through using med but a totally different paradigm, which is tapping into our inner Yiddish and Hashanah, tapping into our inner Jewish soul that is always there and can never be destroyed. But that is for next time. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I appreciate all the comments as well. And uh, I'm going to stop the recording. If anybody has any questions, uh, now's your chance.